All right. So while we wait for Ippy Looney, this is a weekly stream of the Jump Rangers tabletop role-playing game. Very, very briefly, Jump Rangers is about kid-space commandos fighting to provide humanity with a future among the stars. And the reason why that's necessary is because right when humanity was reaching the peak of our civilization, right when we were getting our problems on Earth figured out, um, the Saurian Horde descended from the skies and brushed our civilization aside, and the only way that people could survive was by sneaking aboard their huge, massive motherships and living in the corners that nobody sweeps, just like bed bugs. We creeped aboard their alien starships, and we colonized the planets that they live on. And while the grown-ups are living this very ragtag, rebel base kind of existence, struggling to survive, the kids, or at least some of them, have taken it upon themselves to find ways of using these alien starships to travel to other worlds, to find trade routes between human colonies, to fight back against alien extermination efforts, and to find a way to retake Earth. And we call these heroes Jump Rangers. And this particular game is going to be about a handful of those heroes and their efforts to provide humanity with a future. That's the gist of the game. Um, if anybody wants to check out the game that we're streaming, you can find it uh, for free, or at least the core book is free, on patreon.com backslash jumprangers. And what we're going to be doing here every week, every Saturday at 11 a.m. Pacific, is we're going to be streaming live gameplay of the Jump Rangers universe. If anybody has any questions in the stream, I ask everybody to please feel free to ask. Um, we're here to educate and to entertain. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, what we're going to be doing on this stream in particular is going through... Ah, thank you, Hippie Looney. Thank you very much. We're going to be going through the, the mission materials and the campaign materials that have been written for Jump Rangers up until now. And the game we're going to start with is actually the game in the very back of the core book. It's a mission called First Contact, and uh, we're going to get into gameplay concepts, and we're going to get into... Uh, world-building concepts as they come up and as they become relevant. So if anybody has any particular questions about anything that you're seeing on the stream, please feel free to ask. Uh, we want to make sure that it's all, that it's, that it's clear to everybody. Um, there's also, just briefly, in the introduction section of the core book, um, a conduct of play. The players have already been through it with me in our game zero, which was streamed earlier. Um, so we're not going to go over that now, but if anybody has any questions about safety issues or or how the Jump Rangers universe is managed ethically, please feel free to check out Chapter 1 of the Core Book, and it's all right there for you. Um, before we start, I'm going to ask Lyra and Wizard to tell us a little bit about their characters. I'll explain what the situation is with Buster. Um, before we get started, and then we'll get right into the gameplay. Today is obviously going to be a little bit of a short day because we had some technical challenges, but I think we've got plenty of time to get into a scene or two of the game before we stop the stream. Um, so first of all, Lyra, what, what, who is Lyra? Who are you? What's your connection to the game? Hi, I'm Looney. I'm married to the, to the creator and storyteller. And... Uh, uh, you can find me on social media at Ippy Looney, I P I L U N I, on any of the um, social medias. I, I, I have Ippy Looney on all of them. So, um, and my character, I am playing an eight-year-old named Lyra, and um, she's from the planet of Armageddon. Uh, and she has, uh, she's, um, part of the Xeno Corps, so she kind of, like, has a fascination with different, um, animals and aliens throughout the universe, and, um, she has two, two pets. She has a starlet and a monk squirrel, and they are constantly with her, and, help her with things. Um, she's also uh, autistic, 
um, and sometimes struggles with communication. So uh, that's pretty much Lyra and me. <laughs> and Misha, who is wizard? Hello, I'm Misha, son of one of these people. And you can find me at Misha Digital on Instagram, but I just do drawings. Um, my character is named. <laughs> my character is named uh, Wizard, a seven-year-old of the Psychor, which is a group of the Rangers that specializes specifically in psychic powers that only younger people are able to develop. Um, uh, he has a personal quirk of trying to gain every type of kinesis that is imaginable in this game. <laughs> and how many kinesis do you have right now? At the moment, four telekinesis, electrokinesis, chirokinesis, and pyrokinesis. Excellent. My name's Tennyson. As I mentioned, I'm the creator of Jump Rangers. And you can find me on Twitter at the handle below. And um, for me, this project is about... Uh, uh, a lifelong passion for tabletop role playing and world building. And um, it's a world that I've always felt would, um, would benefit people and empower kids and bring an honest to goodness sense of play and fun back to our culture, which I think is something we've gotten away from with the rampant branding. So I wanted to, I wanted to create something that really invited people and challenged people to explore the things that they enjoy and to and to get into the things that they find fun about storytelling and to um, empower people to kind of you know shake out their inner child and get back to uh, get back to basics and to play with their kids I wanted to create something that brings geek families together and gives them something to enjoy together um, and and that sort of breaks through some of the divisions of geek culture and gives people the opportunity to have fun with one another. So that's, that's what Jump Rangers is all about. Um, and this story, a mission called First Contact, begins on a planet called Link. Now, um, there are a number of massive space empires that define the Jump Rangers universe. The Saurian Horde, who are the monsters that invaded Earth, are ruled by a telepathic race of Tyrannosaurus rexes. And beneath them, they have a, a, a whole separate, not race exactly, but group of lizard men who they control telepathically and who do all of their labor. The Saurian Horde just invades planet after planet, creates massive trash wastelands everywhere they go, and strip mines. Um, the resources of any world they encounter, and that's exactly what they're doing to Earth, and that's also what they're doing to Planet Link. The Saurian Horde's enemies are a race of energy beings called the Loom. And like any sensible energy being, the Loom spend most of their time building giant robots and running around inside the giant robots. So Loom um, and the Saurian Horde are pushing up against one another's sort of borders and empire and planet link is the front line of that war which makes planet link the only world right now where a human being can get off of a saurian mothership and sneak aboard a loom mothership because we don't have interstellar travel of our own we're forced to steal it and planet link is the place where you can get from saurian space into loom space as a result our secret base on planet link is actually a very important What's that? It's not really stealing. It's more like stowing away. Yes, exactly. So, um, Planet Link is important for human civilization because it's a center of travel. And our secret base there, which is a place called Paxis Base, named after its leader, is um, one of the larger human colonies because everybody's always coming and going. Um, it's also an important military installation because Commander Sudro Paxis, who runs uh, Paxis Base, is able to spy both on the Saurian uh, military and Saurian operations and on 
loom operations. The loom don't exactly have a military, but that's how that's how Paxis Base makes itself relevant. And because everybody's always coming and going, one of the other things that makes Paxis Base so special and so distinct is that it's the only place in human space where somebody is maintaining a place just for jump rangers to gather. Uh, that place is called the Ranger's Roost. Everybody calls it the Rooster. And the person who runs the Rooster is an ex-jump ranger named Uncle Slappy. Slappy was his jump ranger's code name, and any grown-up who takes care of the jump rangers or who used to be a jump ranger themselves is usually referred to as an uncle or an aunt. Or a cousin. And um, Uncle Slappy runs a diner in the Ranger's Roost um, where you can come in and he'll make you food. He runs a barracks where jump rangers can always find a good bed and, and catch up with friends and meet other jump rangers. And, and if someone needs help from the jump rangers, the Ranger's Roost is the best place for them to go in all of human space. So, like many adventurers... Um, and like many at the beginning of Mary's many adventure stories, our two heroes, Lyra and Wizard, find themselves um, behind a table in a shady corner of the rooster. This isn't, you know, uh, a fantasy tavern. There's big ceiling fans casting light everywhere. There's dim fluorescent lights. There's buzzing everywhere. Uncle Slappy is behind a grill making all kinds of noise. He will give Jump Rangers coffee as long as they're over 10 years old. But they do not serve adult beverages at the rooster. Um, and the other person who finds themselves at this table is a hovering robot. If you're familiar with the, the movie Batteries Not Included, looks very much like that. It's got all kinds of gears and gizmos that can pop out of it. It's a flying saucer with two little wings and two big eyes right in the middle named Buster. Buster actually is the artificial intelligence that runs all the autopilots in human space. And Buster's a little glitchy and funny. Buster refers to every human being as Sam, and it can't tell the difference between any of us. Um, Buster's not always super great at what Buster's doing, but this particular robot has been um, given the Buster program as a helper to these particular rangers because Uncle Slappy likes them, and he, it was a project that he's been working on in this back room for quite some time. He's very proud of it. Buster's not as reliable as Uncle Slappy would like, but Uncle Slappy does the best he can. Um, because um, our game is supported by Patreon, what we're going to be doing with Buster is making the character available to any patrons who are supporting the game at $10 a month or more. There's, gonna, there's a sign-up sheet right now, in fact. Anybody who wants to play Buster can sign up for a time slot, and you can come and join us on the stream and play with us and hang out. And the fact that different people are playing Buster from week to week isn't really going to have a negative effect on the game because Buster's not all that reliable to begin with. <laughs> is Lou over there? <laughs> Ippy Looney, is that what's going She's attacking me. <laughs> Do you want to show Lou to the stream? I can't. She keeps running away every time. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> so, because we're still in the process of getting our stream started, uh, I didn't want to complicate things by bringing on a buster today, but anyone who's giving $10 a month or more to Jump Rangers and to the development of Jump Rangers is, is our... Welcome guest on the stream. Anytime we don't have a Buster, I'll be playing the character of Buster myself. Um, so, sitting there eating grilled cheese and, uh, and drinking, you know, their coffee and their milk or whatever they happen to be drinking. That's... <laughs> is she still running away or can you pick her up and show her to... Oh, there she is. There's Lou. Hey, Luna. That's Luna, everybody. Okay. Luna's playing Buster today. Now I have Chihuahua <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Letting her sit with me, so she was attacking my feet. Aww. Uh, okay, and now she's now satisfied? Yes. Okay, good. 
<laughs> and oh, Killer Corpse is not a huge fan of dogs. Well, Luna is a huge fan of Jump Rangers, so she gets to be on stream sometimes. Um, is there anything the two of you want to discuss before we get this game started? You've been on a mission. You've learned a few things about the universe. Uh, these are not quite beginning characters for anybody who's watching the stream. There's one or two things they can do that are a little bit above and beyond. Um, and uh, and they're, they're comrades in arms. They're friends from before. We, we like each other because we don't talk to each other. That's how it works. Okay. <laughs> so the two of you are sitting there tersely drinking coffee and enjoying the quiet. I'm not allowed to drink coffee. Yeah, we're both on Oh, the really? Table. We're not drinking coffee. Okay. Yeah, what kind of, what's your favorite What's your favorite juice? I want hot chocolate. Oh. You want hot chocolate? You can have hot chocolate. Go with that. <laughs> All right. So the two of you are sitting there drinking your hot chocolate, enjoying the peace and quiet, the, the buzz and the hum of being in a human base for the first time in probably a few months from whatever it was that you were doing before. When who should walk into the ranger's roost but Commander Sudropaxis himself? Um, he's got black hair. It's a little bit long. It's starting to turn gray. He keeps a beard, and he wears um, uh, sort of a military jumpsuit, not unlike a Jump Ranger's uniform. Um, still keeps his firecracker by his side from the old days. And uh, he is known amongst the Jump Rangers as Uncle Ferret because of his years of service and because um, you know, Paxis Base is a safe place for Jump Rangers to come. And he looks around for a table with room. Right now, the two of you are two of only a handful of jump rangers at the rooster. And everybody else is talking to Uncle Slappy. So Commander Sudropaxis makes his way over to your table. Boss man's a common. He asks you, <laughs> <laughs> do you mind if I help myself to a seat? Sure, why not? We got hot Commander Paxis sits down. He looks back and he says, "Slappy, could I have a, could I have a hot chocolate?" <laughs> <laughs> Slappy puts a hot chocolate in front of the commander. Look, he's trying to endear himself to us. He looks at you and he says, <laughs> <laughs> "He says I'm Commander Sudro Paxis. I'm the one in charge of this installation." We know. <laughs> <laughs> Once upon a time, I was actually a Xeno Ranger. I don't know if you know this about me. My brother was in the Fight Corps. I was Ferret, and he was Fox. Adorable. Now the... <laughs> the two of us have, have grown up, but we're still looking for a way to beat the Saurians. If we can find a weakness they can't ignore, if we can find a way to push them around for a change, I believe we can still save Earth. Now, I think we may have an opportunity to do that right now, and I'm, I'm looking for help. I need help from a pair of jump rangers. Can I count on you? Sure, why not? You got it, boss man. Sure. The commander slides a data deck across the table. He looks at the both of you very seriously, and he says, this is everything our spies, including rangers like yourselves, have collected on the Saurians from the front lines of their fight against the Loom in the last six months. Personally, I've been all over this data. Nothing on here jumps out as an easy fix, but the Loom are pushing the Saurians hard right now. Maybe we can push too. And maybe there's some clues in this data. My brother is General Arden Paxis on Planet Battleground. I'm asking you to take this information to him at Fort Paxis. He's got scientists, he's got engineers. Maybe they'll figure something out. Every six months, there's a Saurian mothership 
It's called the Mothership Menacing that makes the trip from Link to Battleground. She just touched down six hours ago. Sweet. Which means you should have about three days before she leaves again. I'm not promising this is the answer to the Saurian problem or the Loom problem, but when it comes to intelligence like this, every mission could be the mission that saves us all. So, can I count on you to deliver this to Battleground? The package will be delivered. What he said. <laughs> Do you have any questions for me? Is there an easy way into this mothership? Or... So, um, that's a good question. <laughs> every, every single Saurian mothership that sets down on a, a quote-unquote civilized world, on a world that's been heavily colonized by the Saurian horde, is going to vent the nasty, soupy, stinky air that they've been carrying around with them for however many months um, to the outskirts of the Saurian, uh, you know, whether it's a city, whether it's an outpost, they're going to vent that air all the way to the outskirts of that um, installation before they start taking on new air and new supplies. And the hey. vents that they used... What's that? I'm trying to mute you. Hold on. Go ahead. Keep going. <laughs> so there are huge air tunnels with huge fans that run from the spaceport all the way underneath the Saurian outpost to a series of guarded but only lightly guarded basically air towers far far outside uh, the rest of the, the smoke and pollution that the Saurians are generating they're called air cans and as Jump Rangers, you've used air cans to get on and off planets many, many times before on a planet like Link or a planet like Soros. That's always going to be, Soros is the home world of the Saurian Horde. That's always going to be the, the number one sort of option for you. Uh, something else that viewers may not know and that you guys might not know is that Battleground is also a pretty significant world in the, in the galaxy of Jump Rangers. The Saurians only have a small mining outpost on battleground, and humans have built their strongest and biggest military installation. That's where all of our military technology gets tested. It's where they develop all of their battle plans, and General Sudro, or General Arden Paxis, excuse me, is in charge of Fort Paxis. And right now, he's the person That's responsible Fox. for leading. What's that? That's Fox, right? Yes, exactly. Uncle Fox is the only person who's having any military success against the Saurians. We're actually maintaining a front line against them on that planet. And again, it's not a big Saurian installation, but everything that we're learning on Planet Battleground is going to help us um, if and when it ever comes to all-out war. So Battleground is one of the places that you know you can go to fight back. And it's definitely a rallying cry for uh, the human colonies. And General Arden Paxis is a big hero just about everywhere you go. So that's the story with that. Um, as far as the air cans go, um, every sort of docking port... <laughs> they do stink. And um, uh, Commander Paxis tells you if you'd like an escort to the menacing's air cans, I'd be happy to assign a pair of scouts to take you there. I mean, sure. Why not? Make it easier. Sure. The more the merrier. <laughs> <laughs> um, you can also try and sneak aboard the mothership through the Saurian spaceport, but I would not recommend it. No, we'll go up the stink. Fine. <laughs> Do you have any other questions for me? Does no. Yeah. 
I try to send a, a, a data package at least once a year, so he won't be surprised that you're there. I don't think he's looking for you. Oh, it's his birthday present. Surprise! Yeah. That's exactly right. Great. <laughs> cool. I'm gonna. Well, I'm gonna... Um, okay. Hmm? You can. You can. You're gonna do what? Oh. I'm not talking to you. Okay. <laughs> I trust that you won't let it go anywhere. We'll see. But I do want to read it while we're on the on the plane on the on ship the plane. on the plane. <laughs> <laughs> I have yet to eat cool. <laughs> so you guys are going to get some food with uh, Uncle Slappy. Okay. When you're finished here, just come find me in the command center. We'll find two scouts to take you to the air can, and we'll get you on your way to Planet Battleground. Great. Bye. Thank you very much for your help, Rangers. Wow. <laughs> He's like he awkwardly <laughs> being dismissed. <laughs> the commander stands up and sort of looks at his hot chocolate and coughs and puts it on the counter, untasted, and walks away. <laughs> That's a psychological tactic. Hey. <laughs> so, uh, Uncle Slap, we're, going to take, we're taking Buster with us. Yes? Yes, you're taking Buster with you. Buster yeah. is assigned to the both of you. Buster is actually assigned to one of you, but you've been with Buster now for a couple days since you arrived here at at at, at uh, Paxis Base, and he calls you both Sam, and you just don't know anymore which one is the Sam he's supposed to be assigned to. <laughs> 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 that information has been lost to the sands of time. Or the Sams of time. Uh -huh. <laughs> Wait, wait for um, it. Wait. Is there... I got eye rolls. So, is there anything that the two of you would like to do on Planet Link before you try and escape? I think we got all our basic equipment. Right? We, we've got all the... We're starting over with our equipment, right? Um, yes. Yeah, you don't have any of the stuff that you stole on the last on the last adventure. But you do have um, Okay. You do have all of your, your virtues that you picked up along the way. I didn't get okay. any. Uh, I did. Oh you didn't? No. I ran <laughs> away from That's it. Alright. Well we're gonna we'll we I won't I won't hold quick well, thinking against you. You can always try and regain it later. Yeah. We'll, okay. We'll, uh, we'll take a muffin to go, huh? There you go. And Wizard has the data deck? I do. Yeah. No, I gave it to you. I am Wizard. To Buster? Or to Wizard? To Wizard. Yes. Okay. That's it. He's in charge. Except for when we're on the ship, I'm going to read it. Okay. Because, you know, Dino Core. Okie right, dokie. Moving on. <laughs> so the command center of Paxa Space is a humming, technological, sort of grimy, um, oil-ladled mess of activity. There's computer screens and holographic readouts everywhere you look. It's overlooking the main hangar bay, so there's all kinds of fighter craft and um, Hercules mechs coming and going at any particular point in time. You can see them all through a massive window. And Commander Paxis is always standing there with his cup of coffee. Scouts are coming and going. Um, there's tunnels to the surface. And he introduces you to a pair of scouts named Hardcore and Wheels. And Hardcore and Wheels are both riding what's called Cerberus Quads, which are quad bikes with grappling hooks that they can go up and down steep surfaces and blaster cannons. Both of them are two-seat vehicles. And uh, Commander Paxis leads you out onto the hangar floor, introduces you to these two scouts, which are basically all suited up in high-tech, you know, special ops gear. You can't really see their faces through their masks. 
They've got little glowing eye holes that they see through. They've got breathers on. And uh, and they both have blaster rifles strapped to their backs that look like professional commandos. And uh, <clears throat> they shake your hands. Honored to work with you, Rangers. Pleasure. And <laughs> both Where's... of them saddle up on... What's that? It, Wizard and I are talkative, can you tell? Yes. They saddle up on their Cerberus quads, and they motion for the both of you to get on the backs and hold tight. Okay. And they tear off across the hangar bay floor and okay. through a ramp out the doors and up to the surface of Link. Link has been torn apart by the battle between the Saurian Horde and the Loom. The whole surface of the planet is blasted clear, and it's mostly just gray and scorched rock at this point, because at some point, the battle between these two species has raged across any particular part of it, and the weapons that they're using are, are devastating. Um, but that battle is not, you know, is not everywhere at once. It's moving around all the time. To be honest with you, human beings and Commander Pactus in particular don't even know what they're fighting over here. But that's one of the things Commander Paxis is trying to figure out. Um, the good news for you is that the Saurian, you're on the Saurian side of the front line at this particular point in time. So you don't have to cross the front line of the battle to get where you're going. And skimming, let's just make sure that they pull this off. Skimming the, um, uh -oh. the, rock, the ridges and the rock lines, um, hardcore and wheels drive you. Yeah, there's no problems here. Hardcore and wheels drive you um, into the mountains and up and over. And eventually you can see smog and smoke on the horizon as well as the bubbly um, rising spires of basically what looks like a mass of antennas and structures that have been pushed up through a... Um, Tar pit. That is okay. the, the the Saurian outpost. Bubble City is what is what they call it here. And working the the quads down along the uh, the inner side of a massive crater. Wheels and hardcore take shelter behind a massive boulder with an outlook of a much smaller structure with sort of a big bubbly black dome at the middle of it. You can hear a fan sucking air into the dome and down, down, down into the ground with a lookout tower overwatching it. And uh, at this point, the... Uh, the two scouts look at you, and Wheel says that once every half an hour, an Undersore extermination team of eight makes their way through this area looking for any potential disturbances. In that lookout tower, there's always two Undersore guards stationed to watch over the air can. Getting down into the air can means hacking the fan at the top, so that you can slip through um, so that it's slow enough to rappel down to the bottom of the, uh, the massive air tunnel below. But you don't want to actually break the fan when you hack it because at that point they're going to send in some exterminators to see what's going on. Okay. You want okay. me to help or support? What do you guys want from us? Can you take the watchtower? I think we can probably do that. You guys got big guns and armor. Yeah. <laughs> All right. And at that point, Wheels looks over at Hardcore and says, you take the one on the left, I'll take the one on the right. And 
We're going to roll to see how that goes. Okay. All right. All right. Critical success. Um, luckily, both of the undersores in the watchtower go down. Wait. Okay. Um, how should we stop the fan? None of us have tech skills. Don't you have tech tech kinesis? That's Can you one of them missing. Um. <laughs> <laughs> that was my other day. Um, you definitely want to get up on top of that bubble before the extermination team comes back. Wheel I mean, says. We grapples. Yep. Right. How, we, how do we slow the fan? I can't I destroy have... it. We don't want to destroy it. We'll draw uh, people. Um... Um, okay, so I have... Alien starships. Alien starships? Are you guys making your way over to the bubble? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. So the two of you run from the cover of the boulder across the blasted desert of planet Link. Make your way up alongside the uh, the bub the bub the bubular structure. Do you? So you're using your grappling hooks, you said, to get up there? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I want both of you to roll to climb up the side of the bubble before we do anything else. What kind of roll All right. is that? Uh, uh, it's going to be a body roll. So you take... This is how rolling works in Jump Rangers. We're going to go through this step by step. So the dice pool that you're using for any given roll is determined by one of four strengths, body, mind, uh, spirit, and heart. And in this case, it's body. So how many dice do you have in body, wizard? Two. Two dice. And Lyra, how many dice in body do you have? Three. Three dice. In this game, we always use eight-sided dice. So this is what we've got. Um, now we determine the target. You want to roll low in Jump Rangers. <laughs> Ones are critical victories, and you get to re-roll them. Eights are botches. So um, what exactly do you have to roll under? And here's how we figure that out. In the character creation process, you get basically two different kinds of traits for your character. You get virtues, and you get training. And for every item of virtues and training that you have, your difficulty is, is, or your target number is one higher. So every jump ranger has common knowledge and basic training. So the basic target that you always want to roll under is two or under because of common knowledge and basic training. Now we're going to go and look at these characters and see what else they have that's going to help them repel up the side of the bubble. So... You want to start, Lyra? What have you got? Uh -huh. Mark? Quick? Uh, danger sense? I don't think those are good. I'll give you quick. I'll give you danger sense. So now you're at four. Uh, sneaking? Stealth? Yep. You're at six. And starships? No, nope, not starships. Why not? All right. Because no, 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 no. you're not on a starship yet. <laughs> oh no, Fergus. Oh, okay. <laughs> so So you have you have you have three dice and you're rolling six and under. How many victories did you get? Five. Okay. 
you shoot your you shoot your you you attach your grappler to your firecracker you fire it up on the tower you get a you get a fix on it you pull yourself up and as the fan is sucking air down into the air can it's it's hard to keep your footing but you're doing a good job you're you're you got safe and stable up here and um you're ready to help wizard if need be hmm. is that something you want to do uh, yes. Okay. No, yes, yes. No, no, yes, yes. So here's how cooperative actions work in Jump Rangers. For each person that's helping you, you sacrifice one of your dice in exchange for all of the attributes, all of the virtues and training that they can bring to your role. Now, the reason why that's good is because... Once you get above seven in your target, you start adding automatic victories to the roll. So in other words, eight is always a botch. You always take away a victory with an eight. But um, if Wizard has more than seven um, points to, towards his target, he can start adding automatic victories to the roll that he eventually will make with the one die that he has left. So... With Lyra's help, Wizard can actually make it to the top of the air can very safely, even though he might not be the most physically adept character. <laughs> <laughs> That's how that works. So, Wizard, do you want help getting up there, or you want to do it your own way? I want to use my telekinesis for this. Okay. I okay. Not, I can't help that. All right. So strong you... enough. I can't help with that. <laughs> so you're rolling spirit. How many dice and spirit do you have? Seven. Seven. All right. And so common knowledge, basic training, and what else do you have? Uh, I got TK, mind over matter, uh, danger Four. sense, observant, smart, psychic. Five. Five. I'll give you uh, psychic, but not smart. So you are at a target of six. So you're rolling your seven dice. You're looking for sixes and under. The... Six victories. Great. It is, in fact, quite windy up here. But the two of you are sure-footed. You're now on top of the on top of the structure, so you can't be seen from down below. And it's just a question of. And this this turbine is huge. It's you know it's the size of a grain silo. So you do not want to get whacked by those rotor blades. And it's built to suck air from where you are right now all the way into Blister City, which is maybe uh, you know two miles away underground through a massive tunnel. So it's pulling in huge, huge amounts of air. Hmm. Oh. Blister City is the name of the Saurian outpost on Link. Couldn't we scramble it for like a second? That's a pretty good idea. How would you scramble it? Well, I, I happen to have some scramblers. Ah. Well, scramblers do a lot of damage to technology. So oh. it, it's, not, it's not something that'll necessarily wear off unless you don't roll very high on your damage roll. It's a risky move under the circumstances. You could try and augment one of your scramblers. You can try and modify them. If you feel confident in your ability to do so, yeah, I will do that. All right, that's a mind roll, common knowledge, and basic training. And what else have you got to screw with your scramblers? Uh, smart. Yep, uh, that's three. Artistic. Four. I'll give you that. Uh. Alien tech. Okay, mm five. And that's all I have that will work. All right, so you have 
Uh, how many dice in mind? Six. Six. So you're rolling six dice into a target of five to modify your scrambler. Uh, let's see. Five, five, I'm going to say you want to see four victories. Um, I have four victories and one, one, and one, eight. Okay, re-roll the one. The eight takes away a victory, so you have two victories right now. I got another one. Okay, good. You made it. You want to keep rolling the one? And see I, how many you get, or you want to take, take the W? I got, I got, it. I got a, a three after that one. Okay, perfect. All right. So Lyra pulls a scrambler out of her, out of her uh, gear, off her jumpsuit, and tinkers with it for a minute, attaches it to the front of her firecracker, and fires it right into the turbine. <laughs> Lightning crackles everywhere. A little bit of smoke, but not too, too much. And the turbine starts to slow way, 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 way down. And um, climbing down into the, into the air can is going to be um, a moderate roll. So we want to make sure that you guys make another check. And it's going to be a body roll for you, Lyra, and a spirit roll for Wizard. Same roll as before. Okay. You just okay. need two, two victories apiece. Just, just show me that you can get down there safely. That would be okay. six victories plus a one. So Nicely done. Seven victories. Sweet. Wait, wait, wait. Body. My body. Yep. Okay. And your, yours was a target of... Six, I believe. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. Just give me two, two victories. Is all I need. That's three victories. Okay, great. All right, Lyra, you you shoot your grappler up at the uh, at the at the uh, at the turbine. You shoot it down at the turbine. And you swing down through the blades, lower yourself all the way down to the dank base of this massive cylindrical cavern leading off into the into the blister city, the center of blister city. Hmm. Um, and uh, wizard lowers himself down with his telekinesis and the two of you are making your way two miles through this massive, massive tunnel. Wait, two miles. Our um, miles or miles, the dinosaur miles? It's the same distance. Okay. okay. Two, it's really two kilometers. Okay, okay. Actually, I shouldn't say miles because we use the metric system in Jump Rangers because it makes more sense. <laughs> There's no need for for ridiculous math in Jump Rangers. Um, it's a long walk, and you guys just go in silence. It's creepy down here. And it stinks. And it stinks. You put, the um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you put your breathers on. And that's a wise move, actually, because as you make your way finally into the city, there is... So eventually, this, this air can is going to be turned on the other way, and it's going to start sucking air into the mothership. And... One of the things that they do, the, the one of the things that they do to the air is they treat it before it gets into the mothership proper. So once you get and that's it's sucking right now, as a matter of fact. So once you finally get to the space under the spaceport, you um, you see the corridor swing upwards towards another massive fan, and on the other side of that fan is going to be a massive sort of spray room where they just hose the air down with all kinds of chemicals and 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 mix it all together and then it gets sucked through one third last fan into a big hose that's again you know as as big around as a grain silo that they attach to the side of the mothership to just push the air in so if you can get through these two fans and through this treatment room without breaking anything then you can sneak aboard the mothership. <laughs> you can sneak aboard the mothership without attracting any any undersore exterminators. 
Um, how many more scramblers do you have? I started with... I only have the one. But I have electrokinesis. I started with three. You started with three scramblers? Three. Okay. Uh, no. Sorry, just one. That was for something Just else. one? Yeah. Gotcha. But couldn't we, like, do, like... Well, couldn't he, like, block it with a rock or a stick for, like, a second for us to climb through with his little telekinesis stuff and then pull it away right as we get through so it doesn't pause it for too long? Well, that's one option, but he did just mention that he has electrokinesis. We just cut power to it for a second and then let the power come back. Well, okay. <laughs> Why don't we do that? We could do that. <laughs> <laughs> do you want Lyra's help with this role, or do you want to make it on your own? I can probably make it on my own. But I need him to okay. hold it long enough for me to get through, right? It's probably easier than doing telekinesis on the blades. Yeah. <laughs> it's less strenuous. Well, you can always do you can always do both. You know, you can always you can always pull the power from it and slow it down. I mean, the main thing is to slow the fan. Hmm. So if you use both powers, you'll you'll actually be adding to your roll. But it's like so you're making if you, if you it doesn't have to stop completely. Right. We just have to like jump rope, you know, like. Whoop. We yep. <laughs> and it's a big rise up, so you're going to need to use your grappling hook to get up there as well. Hmm. It's a little bit trickier than than if it was, you know, in front of you. It's it's a good story straight up from where you are, pulling air upwards. So uh, you've got a spirit roll to make, wizard. Hmm. Okay. So How many dice in spirit? Seven. Seven. You've got co common knowledge and basic training, that's two. And electrokinesis and telekinesis, that's four. Mind over what else you got? Uh, Five. Uh, observance, smart, psychic, and danger sense. I'll give you um, smart, Science. which is six. I'll give you psychic, seven. Yep, seven plus one. So you have an automatic victory. Your target is seven. I'll give you science. That is six. Don't pull any. That's all. Five. Six victories plus the one. All right. The fan is slowed. You guys have your breathers in. <clears throat> so you're not going to be assaulted by the toxic chemicals on the other side of the fan. And I want both of you guys to make a moderate roll to make your way up through the fan. Wizard, that's your body. That's your uh, spirit. And Lyra, yeah. You got five victories, you said? Uh -huh. Under what, six? Six and under? Yours is six and under. Mine was five and under. That's seven victories. Okay. I got Wizard four. Wizard hoists himself. <laughs> okay, perfect. Lyra, you, you grapple, you shoot a grapple off from your, from your uh, firecracker. The firecracker is a blaster weapon that you can attach missiles to the front of. For anybody who's watching the stream, it's the it's the traditional weapon of the Jump Rangers. I launched myself. And you you up the tube. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yep. You you shoot right up. Lyra uh, winches herself up after you, and the two of you are inside the treatment room. There's it's nasty in here. There's chemicals being sprayed from every direction, and it's certainly abrasive. But you guys have your breathers in, so you're safe. You have one more fan to deal with. I mean... You could do that again, right? Same. <laughs> yeah. Yep. That's not the most entertaining. It's right in front of you, so you won't... You can, you can step through this fan relatively easily, because it's in front of you. It's a big wall of blades okay. spinning around. So go for it. So that's one victory inherently... Seven victories plus a one. Eight victories. Don't roll a bunch of eights. Good. 
<laughs> the two of you step. Perfect. So you step through. You step through the the spinning blades, and now you're inside a massive segmented hose. Um, and the segments are 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 something you can actually grab onto and climb your way up. Hmm. Kind of like a kind of like a a cable conduit, except you're on the inside of it. And, you know, if you were seeing this from the outside, you'd see that there are massive cranes holding this thing in place, plugging it into the inside of the mothership, which is floating over the surface of the spaceport. But all you've got a view of is, you know, the next sort of rung of the massive interior ladder that you're climbing. You make your way up and up and up. Um, and eventually, it levels off, and you pass through the coupling. There's huge, bulky, armored blast doors on either side of you that would slide into place if this coupling were detached so that the, you know, the air systems of the mothership would not be exposed to the vacuum of space. And then you are inside the air vents of the Saurian mothership. Do you guys have a plan for finding a place to hide? Generally speaking... Human beings like to go and hide somewhere near the trash systems because that's the place the undersores like to go the least. Um, but it's uncomfortable and it's stinky, and you guys might want to try something else. How long is this trip going to be? Theoretically, three weeks. Hmm. And there's like no other like little. Like pot of people living on this ship, because I thought that was one of the things. There's like little... uh, and some other ships. Most of the time, people prefer to live on planet-side colonies now, and motherships are used mostly for sneaking around. This particular mothership is not one that you're familiar with, um, and there are certainly very small colonies on some Saurian motherships but not the mothership menacing. You guys are here by yourselves. Hmm. Um, is that Sam? What? Oh yeah, Buster is Buster is 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 hovering right behind you. All right. The whole time. <laughs> yep, Buster's Buster's keeping pace with you guys. <laughs> I forgot we could use him. <laughs> um, um. I think we should go to the trash area because it's the quietest. Okay. And with that in mind, Buster actually has a scanner that can help you. Wow. Hold on a moment, Sam. I think I might be able to Scan the area in front of us. I do that with my. What do you think, sir? <laughs> Hang tight, one sec. Poor Buster tries to. Oh wow! Good job, Buster. <laughs> All right. Buster whips out his his environment scanner on the first try. Nice. Okay. And uh. And it's a little light sounding, not too noisy, little doo -doo 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 scanner. Doo -doo 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 -doo. Doo -doo -doo. That's right. We're going to see if any of the undersore technicians working in the depths of the uh, Mothership Menacing hear Buster's scanner. No. <laughs> That's a no. <laughs> it's a sad day to be an undersore technician. <laughs> so, uh, Buster is scanning for Saurian presence. He manages to steer the two of you away from any potentially deadly encounters. And you make your way into the trash system of the mothership menacing. As you can imagine, there are 
trash system spread out all the way through the ship, and that garbage all gets pushed towards massive airlocks where it all gets dumped out into space basically any time that the that the um the airlock room gets full. So the best place for humans to hide is on the other side of the wall with all the sort of compacting systems and everything. Because it's noisy and nobody can uh nobody can hear what you're doing in there, nobody ever checks it. So it's a good thing you to make talk your to. What's that? I said it's a good thing we don't talk to each other. It's gonna be too noisy. Yep. So uh with that said, the two of you set up a little base camp inside the trash recycling systems of the mothership menacing. And you prepare yourselves to while away the three weeks uh, of travel. Is there anything the two of you want to do while you're on board the mothership? I want to learn information from the tech deck. All right. All right. Roll uh, mind to see if you can break that information down. What are you? What do you have to help you with this? Uh, smart, autistic, observant. Yep. Uh, yep. Common knowledge, basic training. That's uh, five. Aliens. Yep, I'll give you that. That's six. And for some reason, I kind of feel like Star Devourers is the thing that's going to be important. Not on this roll. Ah, dang it. it will. Okay. <laughs> so roll your mind into a target of six. Tell me how many victories you get. Six. Six victories. So there's a ton of sort of records in this data of uh, what happens when Saurian and Loom weapons are discharged, as well as readings on the energy systems uh, that power Saurian and Loom technology. There's close-up readings on the octonium reactors of Saurian motherships. There's close-up readings on the octonium reactors of Dragon Starfighters. Some of these scouts have gotten deep, deep, deep inside Blister City, and 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 the, you know disruptor cannons that are mounted inside Blister City as defensive tools. They've gotten some pretty close-up scans of a lot of this technology. It's actually pretty impressive and a little bit scary. The work that they do is is uh, dangerous, to be sure. To get close enough to get any of this stuff, let alone all of it, is kind of a big deal. Um, and <clears throat> certainly careful study and discipline would teach you how to detect and possibly jam or otherwise affect or alter the radiation signatures that this technology creates. So it's not useless by any means. They're starting yard work out front. I can't hear it through your mic. Okay. It's just very loud to me. Um, Got it. Okay. That, well, that, if... So because of that, I only heard like half of what you said. But that's okay. I'll figure it out. Did you get the gist of what I said? Mm hmm Okay. Well, if it's getting loud outside, then we can always cut the stream half an hour early. We're getting towards a good breaking point. Is there anything else you guys want to do while you're on board the menacing? Can't think of much else. You can okay. <laughs> I don't know if I can learn kinesis without further training from someone who does know those kinesis. Ah, uh, very loud. <laughs> that's That's true. <laughs> well okay. so so about my uh, hmm? I said you can help me better my telekinesis so I don't have to communicate so much telekinesis is moving things I don't know I mean, telepathy sorry not that one 
<laughs> I don't have that one. Oh, you don't? No. Purely well, physical. then. We'll just uh, sit here and I'm reading the, 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 the deck deck. Tech deck. Do you have, do you have telepathy? I have tele telepathy, yes. Hmm. Do you want to teach it to wizard? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> you guys, you know, you think you have three weeks. So you sit there and you practice communicating with your minds. Um, but... Just under two weeks later, to your surprise, um, the whole mothership shudders as it sort of powers out of hyperspace. And then everything starts to shake as it descends over a planet. Um, whatever this planet is, it is not planet battleground because you have not been on this spaceship long enough to get to planet battleground. Oops. So you've gone somewhere. Yep, you've gone somewhere you did not expect to go. And another Hex. week of training. Hex yeah. Was... yeah, it does seem as though his information was was wrong. Um, but you're going to have to figure that out next week as the mothership descends and you feel you hear the uh, the the. Any gravity engines winding up to press against the planet, the mothership settles into um, a hovering position over an alien world. An alien world you don't know anything about. And then finally, the massive cargo bay doors of the mothership start to open, and you can hear the whole ship begin to hum as the undersores go to work unpacking whatever it is they've brought to this alien planet. Uh, one more week of study and you will have wizard trained up in telepathy. But that week is going to have to happen when you are in a safe and quiet space. Um, and this is not that space any longer. So we'll come back next week and find out exactly where the Mothership Menacing has landed. And until then, um, it's time for our postmortem on our first broadcast of the Saturday Morning Cartoon Show. Does anybody have any questions for us? Last time I trust someone named Ferret. <laughs> <laughs> uh, does Ippy Looney or Misha have any questions or comments about the game? No. No, no, I, I, I like where we started. OK, good. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, in that case, we're signing off. Thank you to Killer Corpse and Adorable for joining us on stream. We'll have this posted on YouTube, and uh, yeah. we'll edit the chunky, frustrating wait, parts wait. out for anybody who... What's say hello up? to P-Mail. P-Mail, too. Say hello. Say hello to P-Mail. Uh, if P-Mail is watching, hello, P-Mail. If you watch this later, hello. And we'll be back next Saturday at 11 a.m. Uh, to continue the Saturday morning cartoon show. Thank you for watching, everybody, and we'll see you next week.